So first we have uh, Kelly Jensen. Kelly is uh, running our new individual group and she's gonna talk to us about what she's hearing from people. Um, next we have Cheryl Driscoll. She's uh, one of our client service managers, one of the more technical people we have in the office, which is why I really wanted her up here. Same thing can be said for Natalie McManaman. Natalie works on um, almost all size groups and is gonna kind of talk to us about small group today. And then we have Rob Kidwell who works again on all size groups, but mostly on more of the larger market. So we're gonna talk to them today about kind of what you've been seeing and uh, um, you know, what advice you can give everybody that's sitting in this room. So my first question is, um, you know, I think the MetLife study that Don quoted was more generous than this, but there's a big study that just came out uh, just a couple weeks ago in the Journal of Health Economics, and it basically looked at Americans between the ages of 25 and 64, and it turns out that just 14% of people understand basic insurance concepts such as deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, and out-of-pocket max. So if we're all supposed to be more educated consumers and that's how this whole system's gonna work, I mean, do these, Kelly, you wanna start, do these statistics surprise you as you? Not, not at all. Okay. So any individual in getting ready for healthcare reform and getting ready for the individual mandate, the big challenge is education and not just education about reform and about the law and about penalty if you don't have insurance, but what is health insurance is one of the biggest obstacles that we're seeing in, you know, a lot of our groups that have a large population of uninsured people, they have no idea what, a, what the difference between a copay and a premium is, and so there's a, a tremendous amount of education involved. Cheryl, do you think that your group employees, do you think they're better educated? I hope so. Most of us have open enrollments. Um, part of the problem with open enrollments is sometimes the lack of participation. I'm not sure how you can fix that because that's one of our goals is to educate, you know, what HMOs are, what PPOs are. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge because you talk about healthcare and you get this glazed look of people, you know. I think it's really important though this year that everybody gets there, somehow encourage them. I don't know if it's lunches, food, prizes, something to get them in there because things change drastically on plans this year for small group. Um, and it's very important because we, you, get, you get all the questions, we get all the questions, and when they're unhappy, it's not a pretty sight. I would just add, I think, you know, even you all out here, you know, we talk about benefits day in and day out with all our clients, but you generally talk about it most right around your open enrollment, and it's an education process for you as well. I mean, I think a lot of this is just, unless you have to use it every day, um, you kind of lose sight of what, you know, all the different components are of your plan and such. So education is key, and like Cheryl said, you know, with all the plans in the small group market changing, then everybody will want to know what their new plan looks like, how it works and such. So, yep. So employee communication. So there's this new exchange notice, and Dawn talked about it, and it's a standard notice. You don't have to use their notice, but why bother creating your own? And so we've, we've done like cover letters and stuff, but does this help? I mean, do you think, does this notice help? Well, I can tell you that for individ the individual, um, like I said, groups that have a large population of uninsured, it sort of kicked off an employee outreach program for us, specifically for education. So we have groups that, you know, we put posters and flyers and uh, payroll stuffers so that um, if you don't have insurance to work, you can call us and we can start the education process. So the notice was important and we have already started getting those phone calls. You know, what do I do if I only have a taxpayer identification number, if I don't have a social security number? What do I, what's a premium? How do I get a plan? You know, all of those questions we've already started getting and so that's been good for, for us. Um, are most of your groups, so they, they're what, they came out a couple weeks ago and they said there's no penalty if you don't do this notice, but you're supposed to still do it. I mean, I think in general we think it's a good idea. Are most employers still going forward with it? Well, since we sent ours out like a month and a half ago, two months ago, I think most of our employers have sent theirs out already. And most of our employers, it's, they're all covering their employees, so I don't think they really, I would say most employees didn't read them. They mm -hmm. took them, threw them away, honestly. But because they're covered. I mean, so it basically right. said, if you're covered, ignore this. Yeah, any thoughts on the notices or? 
Well, for, yeah, for a lot of our clients, we've encouraged them to send out, especially for those who have employees that tend to come back and ask a lot of questions after open enrollment. So we've encouraged those, those companies to really communicate this whole exchange notice because we know that these employees are going to, you know, go to the exchange after the fact, those that didn't, you know, waived coverage. We think a lot of these are going to come back and say, hey, we didn't, you know, we don't have benefits that meet the mandate, and they're going to go try and get ex coverage to the exchange. So, you know, we're really trying to encourage communication as much as they can to those types of employees to say, listen, the benefit plan that we're offering you does meet that minimum requirement or minimum mandated benefit. So, again, it's really about the communication going forward about what's going on in 2014. Yeah, and I just, to, to Rob's point, the most important thing that I, we're communicating is um, you don't just go out and buy a health plan because you decide you're sick. You know, you have a very finite open enrollment period to buy an individual health plan. So that's probably the most important piece of information on that notice. So talk to us about that open enrollment period, because I think some people do think, I'll just call on my way to the hospital. How's right, when I, if I discover that I have <laughs> breast cancer, I'll just call and I'll get some insurance. But that's not the way it works. So um, the open enrollment, the first open enrollment period is October 1st as I'm sure you've all been made aware, through um, March 31st for the 2014, and that is an extended open enrollment period for the kickoff of Obamacare, but the following year, it's uh, October 15th, 2014, through December 7th, 2014, so it's really much, two and a half months, similar to Medicare open enrollment, and that's it unless you have a qualifying event. So I would say that that's the single most piece of, important piece of information for the uninsured. Yeah, so if you lose your job, that is a qualifying event because you're going to lose your group coverage. And then you can go and get on the exchange at that time. But outside of that, you can't just go get coverage just whenever you want to. It has to follow the same, the same procedure as a qualifying event that you have now for, for enrollment under your group plan. So public awareness, there's been, these are just headlines that I grabbed. Calbridge, California looks to distribute 43 million, another 37 million in grants for outreach and education, 3.4 to help people enrolling in health benefit exchange. There's a ton of money going into this, uh, this awareness effort. Kelly, how are, is it gonna work? Where are the, where's the money going? Who, who's gonna help do this? So the money has gone primarily to nonprofit organizations and a lot of nonprofit organizations that um, help people who have language barriers, um, you know, is it going to help? I certainly hope so because education is critical to the success of, you know, Obamacare. So I, I don't know. I know that for our employers, they are relying on us to help. Um, and even some of those nonprofit organizations have called us and we've partnered with them to help them get the word out and to explain what is a premium, what is a co everything that goes into having health insurance and being, health being healthy. Do you think that most people have a general sense, of, are people even aware of the exchange? I mean, do you think most people in California? You know, it, we've gotten off to a slow start, you know. Um, the politics still seem to be dominating the headlines, which I don't think helps the consumer because that space in the headlines that could be taken up with what is an exchange and even what is health insurance, and so we're a little bit behind in, in terms of the education piece that the consumer needs to um, buy insurance and make an informed decision. Um, I, I've had a couple of people say, oh, well, I'm, do you think it'll be delayed like next week? Do, I mean, are we expecting that at this point? Or? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't really see at this point it, how it could be that, the, that ship has sailed. So you mentioned the media. This was interesting. This actually was just something that came out last week. The Department of Health and Human Services commissioned the um, RAND Group, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, um, and they did a study on the 17 states that have come out with um, all of their rates for their exchanges. And they said something like, the authors find that the law has little effect on small group premiums and find large variation in the effects for non-group premiums across states. So basically, small employers, it's going to be remain pretty consistent, but there's going to be a lot of variation in the individual market. So then the Heritage Foundation, who clearly wants nothing to do with any of this, came out and said on the same day that the RAND Foundation estimated a 22% increase in average premiums due to Obamacare next year, with several states experiencing an increase of 30% or more, where Bloomberg went exactly the opposite and said, predictions of sharp increases in health insurance premiums for people getting coverage have been overstated, and many states will see little or no change. How is anyone supposed to know what to expect? It's all speculation at this point. You know, yeah. the, the plans are just coming out. 
You know, in California, we ha have had enjoyed a pretty strong in individual market. Of course, we've had the pre-existing conditions and health questionnaires, and so we have our 50% denials, of course. But in other areas of the country, you know, they, they have maybe one or two carriers, if they're lucky. You know, they have terrible plan options and very high rates of denial. So I'm sure that competition is better for them, and I'm sure the rates are going to go up for them because it's a real health plan. So, you know, it's not really an apples and apples comparison. A lot of these rate increases you're seeing, you know, you're seeing a plan where you had no benefits, and now you're seeing a plan where you have, you know, full essential health benefits. So how can you really compare? So I guess, Natalie or Rob, as you're kind of getting into your new renewals, are you finding, is the politics of all this stuff still sort of part of the renewal meetings, or do you think that, do you think people, that that ship has sailed and they're just getting to it now? Well, I'll let you, I'll let you start um, on that one. Well, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of politics in it. The, the renewal piece that I think is most frustrating to employers that we're finding right now is they don't like that 4%, anywhere from 4 to 5% rate increase just on the taxes piece. You know, they don't want to accept that. They don't understand it. Um, there's the ACA fee, and it depends on the carrier and what their market share is. And so we're coming out, you know, again, with a trend increase, say, of 12%. But on top of the 12% increase is a 4% tax increase on ACA. So it's a 16% increase. So that's very frustrating to go out to your employer group with that kind of an increase. I mean, 12 is bad enough, but then to increase it 4% because of taxes? You know, it's very difficult to communicate that not only to a CFO, but then to have to, uh, you know, explain it to the employees. You know, we don't want to use negative language, but to explain that you know, fees are going up, your contributions could potentially increase because our rates have increased due to ACA. So it's, it's a difficult market route right now. And, and the, the politics play into it, it's, it's more that they're, I would say that the, the, you know, the employer is upset with the situation more than anything else and the carrier. All right, so let's, let's get to what everybody kind of really wants to talk about, which is the cost of coverage, what we're starting to see. So starting with the, the individual mandate, um, this, this uh, it was an Avalier Health study. It's the biggest one that's come out. Also, they went through the, all the data on the 17 states, and they said that overall competition really does seem to be working, that we have a real marketplace in these 17 states, and that the rates are lower than what were expected. And so for a 21-year-old, a mid-range policy would run around 270 a month. For a 40-year-old, it would run about 330 a month for a mid-range policy, again, individual plan. And 615 would be a mid-range policy for a 60-year-old. So now if I'm a, as an insurance person, if I look at this and say a mid-range policy for a 40-year-old at 330, that seems really affordable to us because we deal with these numbers all the time. But if you're somebody without health insurance, do we think, is this affordable for them? I mean, do we think this is going to... I think it depends on how much that person is paying for health care out of pocket, how much an uninsured person is paying when they visit the doctor. You know, how, what procedures have they let go because they couldn't afford to pay them because they were considered elective or because they could get by without them. You know, they've been limping along. If you've been paying any kind of money at all for asthma or diabetes or any of these chronic conditions, then it, it's going to be a good deal for you. You know, if you kind of maybe go to the county hospital once a year with the flu, maybe not. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think it, everybody's situation, I think, is different. Let's jump into small group then. Cheryl, what is this? We got an early renewal letter from, from Kaiser. What, what is this? What do they do with this? So Kaiser or all the carriers have come out that you can early renewal. So what this means is if you have a August renewal, so you're just already renewed, they are coming out with rates for you for December 1st. And they're saying you can take this increase, 3 4%, and your new next renewal will be next December. Why should you do this? Well, rates coming out, and the only one I can talk to right now is Shield. Blue Shield sent out us a rate, what your predicted rate will be. Most of our groups are looking at, for Blue Shield, um, 20 to 30 percent rate increase as of June, uh, January 1st. Depending on your plan, it's not for everybody, but depending on your plan, we're looking at 30 to, or 20 to 30 percent rate increase. So you can delay this by renewing early, 
December 1st. Um, you'll take a little bit of an increase from whenever your last renewal was, and you don't renew until next December. So you get a whole year of savings on that. The reason everybody, and it's different for every single group, and, but everybody that's in the small group market should review. If you're with us, you will get us telling you you should look at it. It works sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. Um, but if you're not with us, you should have your broker and ask them why, if you haven't heard about this, why you haven't heard about it, because it can save you money. Um, it's just an option. There's other things that come into play, such as employer or your contributions. Right now you work off a grid. The new rates are each age is a different rate. And then each person, as Michelle had stated previously, each, your spouse, you have to add, your children. So nobody, a 40-year-old family, if she has a, she's 40 and she has a family of four and I'm a 40, <laughs> I'm making us way younger. Our rates could not could easily not be the same because our spouses are different ages and our children are different ages. So it, it's going to make your contribution strategy way. This gives you time to evaluate and how to do it. It's, and that's all you're doing is buying yourself some time. And we don't have answers on a lot of questions because I don't have rates for January 1st. Another thing that comes into play in this is um, when you move into the new market in 2014, um, all the plans are canceled. They're being mapped to new plans. And some of you may have experienced that already in the past, where your plan gets canceled and replaced by another plan. So that's essentially what's happening, but basically every plan is getting canceled and replaced. And in some cases, and um, I'll take Kaiser as an example, um, if you are participating in the HSA 02700 plan, if that's familiar to you, um, that plan is being mapped to an HSA plan that now has a $1,500 deductible. So there you have a situation where, yeah, you're seeing a 30% increase on your renewal if you were to just go to your mapped plan, but your mapped plan is now half the deductible. So you have to go through and dig a little deeper into, okay, what am I being mapped to? Um, you know, what's that benefit versus the benefit I have now? So there's, there's a lot of, you know, different elements that come into it. So really um, can't stress enough, everybody should take a look at their, their, every small business should take a look at their individual situation and evaluate if they've got multiple carriers, you gotta look at you know, both sides of the, um, you know, the spectrum there. And um, it's, you know, it's an analysis, not only just financially, but you wanna take a look at the benefit that you're getting as a result of that. And then also you know, how it fits in with your whole business and how your business runs because, you know, moving from a June or July renewal that may be, you know, lined with your fiscal year to a December 1st may, may have its drawbacks as well. So lots of things to think about. Um, yeah. So speaking of confusing, who wants to explain what this is? That is the That's new scary. rate tables. So you used to have a grid and it would be 20 to 30 or 20 to 29, 30 to 39. Well, now you have an age for every age. I mean, a rate for every age. <laughs> and this is how you're gonna see your rates. And area. And area, oh, yeah, and now every area. So you used to be, um, Anthem would do it, Anthem was always by where your employee lived. Shield was by where the company was. Now it's going to be where your employees live. So it's not only based on their ages, it's where their zip code is. So this is why I was saying contributions are gonna have to be really thought about because you could have, and even with, I have a company that I was working on yesterday that had um, 30 employees, 27 employees, and they had five different rating areas. And that's just the way it's gonna be. So it's gonna just be labor intensive. We are working, um, Every day we go on our little websites that have quoting engines and I was talking to one of our senior um, brokers, well, one of the main brokers, and he uh, and I were talking about how are we gonna do this for you guys? And hopefully we're gonna be able to do individual um, 
sheets for your employees. If you give us the information of zip code and all their dependents, we'll be able for open enrollment or new hire to have an individual sheet for each employee because I don't know that we're gonna be able to just give you these one sheets and say here's the rates because it just isn't that easy. Okay, so is it better to not offer coverage to the dependents so they can get the subsidy? And, I, and I honestly, it depends company-wide. That means there are some companies that have benefits as a huge part of their company culture. So it really depends on each company each scenario. So the shop uh, covered California. Are we gonna are we gonna encourage anybody to go to the shop? Groups. Or, yeah, groups. Um, our take on this is no because we haven't seen a whole lot out of it and. I always advise our clients when a new carrier comes around, let's wait a year and see how it works. And, um, and the perfect example is Sea Changed. We sold very little Sea Changed its first year. Then they came out with a great plan, and we sold a lot of it. And it, it's been great, but we kind of let them work all the bugs out before we put any of our clients with them. All right, so large group, jumping into 50 plus. Composite rates. So these are some of the headlines. UPS cuts insurance to 15,000 spouses, blames Obamacare. Uh, multiple franchises cut employees' hours, blames Obamacare. Um, but Starbucks CEO said he won't use Obamacare as an excuse to cut workers' benefits. So Rob, what are, what are you kind of seeing? How's everybody feeling? What are you seeing on your renewals? I think this year a lot of people, um, well two things. One, we're seeing a lot of carriers out there being very cautious. So when we go out to market, a lot of our carriers are coming back with declinations. They don't want to quote this year because they don't know how all these ACAs are going to, um, fees are going to factor into it. So they're being very cautious about uh, quoting. From, a, from an HR standpoint, we're just getting a lot of questions regarding you know, the whole UPS part about you know, do we really need to cover our, our dependents, you know, spouses, if they're offered other coverage through you know, their employer. And in the Silicon Valley, especially in the high-tech world where you have so many uh, families where you have dual income, it's, it's a huge thing for them to figure out. Now, I would say this year they're going to let the dust settle. That's kind of what I'm hearing. But I definitely see going forward that they're going to look at this UPS model and incorporate it because, again, what they don't want to see happen is to pay for a lot of additional premiums because they do offer a, a fair... Uh, dependent contribution, they don't want to see a lot of additional premium going out the door when somebody has dual coverage. So again, you know, this is a very interesting year going forward. We're seeing a lot of the carriers being very cautious and, you know, we're really speaking to our HR teams about long-term strategies and what they want to accomplish going forward, not just looking for next year, but in years to come. Now, what do your renewals look like? Are you seeing those 20, 30 percent in your large group? I, I've seen one that an outlier group that was 25 percent, um, but that again, you know, that was one group. Uh, I'm seeing most of the renewals between, say, 16 and 12. Um, and in the past, a lot of groups, you know, they were carriers would say, you know, we'll drop to this rate, you know, this increase if you don't market it. You have to market, yet your broker should market every time this year because, again, that's the only way you can really negotiate with your carriers going forward. Because, again, um, the market is changing, and you do need to go out and be competitive with and see what other carriers have to bear. And now, changing is a huge factor, but again, you're seeing larger than normal increases only because of the 4% ACA fees. Again, granted, what, what carrier that is. So, again, Really market your benefits. If you're a 1-1 one -one renewal, you probably already have. Um, but again, be careful this year and make sure that you are um, marketing your benefits. Now, I talked about self-insurance a little bit. You get to avoid one of the fees. The products seem to be coming down. Is this more of an alternative for the mid-market? Are you doing much more of it? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we are seeing, we're, we're going out and getting self-insured rates and self-insured proposals. And the reason for that is, Again, if, if other carriers for fully insured plans aren't being competitive, then the self-insured market gives you some great ammunition to go back and say, listen, we've done the analysis. You can be self-insured, save a lot of money. But again, that's just a whole other animal, and there's a lot more administration. But it is something that we've quoted 
a lot on all of our groups this year, especially those above 100 employees, because again, it, it just gives you more data to go back to the incumbent carrier and say, that increase of 16% isn't justifiable. Here are, here's the reasons why. So you, you really do need to be strategic going forward um, with these increases. All right, so a couple of slides right at the end to review. If your head's like, Whoa, what do I do with all this stuff? If you are a small group, if you are under 50 employees, what do you have to do right now? You have to get out your notice if you have not done so. You have to decide if you want to early renew, and then you just need to think about your communication and benefit policy changes. All these employer mandates, if you're under 50, that's where the market's going, but that's not where you have to go. All you need to worry about right now, get out your exchange notice, meet with your broker about early renewal. Large group, a little bit more. These are your, those of you that are 50. You also need to get out your exchange notice to all of your employees. If you have the early renewal option, decide if it's appropriate for you to do so. But if you're over 50 and you're on a small group plan, think about more than just the rate on that early renewal option because that is gonna mess up your renewal date and a number of other things. It won't line up with your flex plan. So have put a little more, a little more thought into that versus just taking the, the lower rate. Um, and then you're gonna to wanna to evaluate the need for communication and benefit policy changes in regards to what we just discussed. Because if you're gonna change your communication campaign, if you're gonna change anything about your workforce, you wanna start, start thinking about it now. So that's all you really have to do right now. Some information sources. If you're a Felice client, you all have access to myfelice.com. If you haven't been on there in a while, we have great communication materials. You can just slap your name and logo on it. We've got whole campaigns for you. Uh, e-individual, Kelly's site, eindividualhealth.com. They've got some great information on there about Covered California, which you can find at Covered CA. Uh, Department of Labor is now doing free webinars all the time and on really specific topics. So like there was one the other day about tips and there was another one about restaurants with healthcare and they've done stuff on staffing agencies. So you can belong to a little feed where you'll, you'll get an update on what all those are. Um, and Kaiser Foundation, Kaiser Foundation is a great one if you have employees in other states and you don't know what's going on in, in that particular state. It's not Kaiser, it's just their, um, it's a, it's a nonprofit. And then healthaffairs.org is a really good one about the kind of the philosophy with healthcare and, and what they're trying to achieve.